order at 5.30. And I would like Council Regan to lead us in the pledge, please. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation indivisible, liberty, and justice, for justice for all. Beat me. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank that. You. So on our agenda, uh, our next item I have is roll call. City clerk, please. Councilor Noon. Here. Councilor Galanese. Here. Councilor Burrell. Here. Councilor Peeler. Here. Councilor Regan. Here. Councilor Camera. Here. Councilor Salamandra. Councilor Pruitt. Here. Mayor Valentino. Here. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, so after roll call, I have just one blanketed item called council discussions. And so we developed these work sessions to be able for council to kind of bat things around and have open conversations, which is important. Um, I believe that at our last meeting, I kind of want to stick to that. We, we talked about beautification, so I'd like to kick things off from there. And then the floor is kind of open. We talked about a variety of different um, topics we'd like to talk about. Uh, it is a work session. Please be polite to each other. Be respectful. Let everybody have their conversation and talk. But to kick off beautification, I'm not sure if I, I'm going to ask Sage or a representative from that group to, to come forward, please. I, I can start, but the group is Jan, uh, Councillor Regan, Councillor Noon, and Councillor Keeler. And this started off as we had two subcommittees at beautification and finance. And this group, uh, when COVID hit, did make a momentary shift of trying to get resources. Uh, to the community that were bringing bad experience in place. And so Councillor Regan did a lot of work downtown. We saw the high school posters that went up. There were many hands doing that work, uh, but Councillor Regan was making sure that uh, there was a presence of beautification in the, the highest form of all of our high school seniors. Uh, there were two items that they're moving forward right now. One of them is taking up you all as a council have passed a resolution regarding the landfill and interest there to uh, move forward uh, with, in, in your sense, compensation. The county came to me and had some clarification uh, that needed to happen after the resolution. So my recommendation was to utilize the beautification committee to work with our county supervisors. You know, they are the spokespeople for the city of Geneva, the conduit of information and also those that can represent us as a county and wanted to really nurture that relationship. So uh, there's a couple other counselors that are interested in participating in that. Uh, we're reaching out to our town supervisor as well as he sits on the environmental committee so that we can have a uh, dialogue and conversation and start to work towards the items that you're wanting to move forward and the things that you'd like to see and also learn from each other at, as well. So that'll be uh, moving forward um, soon. The other item was just focusing on code complaints. So you might get uh, throughout our city resident quality of life. You have the temporary ones, snow removal. Uh, you have grass not being mowed. You have trash that's there. And then you have larger ones that might be, you know, structural issues of a home, peeling paint, uh, things that may last season to season that uh, really kind of neighbors bring it up to counselors, they bring it up to uh, either our code department, our DPW department, or our fire department as well. And so our beautification committee met with Neil Brayman, and out of that, we kind of came to uh, an action step that our staff is excited about. So in the current practice, complaints come in from all over, and, and there's several tracking systems. Jackie in the DPW, if you called her and talked with her is more on the code side that deals with the grass, the snow, the trash. And then on the fire department side, uh, and then also members of our code deal with more the, the building codes, so the peeling paint or the structural issues or slew of other things that might come in. And so we're gonna simplify, and so this will be coming out and really uh, need your efforts on that, uh, is to have a complaint process 
to have a form, to have a central email, perhaps even a central number. So it doesn't come into one person, get resolved, uh, or go into a chain of, of action steps that is harder for somebody if they call someone else in staff and people don't know uh, how to track it down. So that'll be coming out. We'll have a one central tracking system that everybody can look at. So if you're talking to somebody, they'll be able to look up and say, yes, the letter went out here. We're waiting for this next step. And try to, as we evolve, work on a process that makes it easier for you all to get information, but also residents that may be following up on a complaint with us to know where it's at. Um, and so I'll pass it maybe over to the beautification committee on that, but that's something that uh, staff jumped right up on board saying, yep, a good constructive feedback that the tracking system was very much more scattered uh, and looking now to working on something that's a little bit more unified. So thank you to the beautification committee for picking that topic so that we could dive in and from an outsider not being in there, see that the view and, and provide us some opportunity for growth. So I'll, I'll stop there on the beautification committee to see if what others want to, there have been other, many, many other topics that we've been focused been talking about that some of you might want to bring forward at this time too. Okay. Council Peeler, I see your hand up. Yeah, just to update the council on some information about the host agreement. I did read the host agreement with the Ontario County quite extensively and I found some language in that host agreement that I think is interesting, especially in the realm of beautification and how that's actually part of a lot of the themes of that host agreement. And they acknowledge that the landfill, um, you know, is a, is a, is a burden that, uh, that has to offset some expenses. And a lot of that is tied to the land use, but there's some other items that I think we can explore and approach uh, Ontario County with kind of our um, advocacy points. And I, I've reached out to Lou Gard and he's interested in, in talking about the topic. And, you know, I think it's just the right way to go is to present him with this information. He already provided some information about how the county flew up over the landfill with an infrared drone and tried to find the gaseous hot spots that were emitting the odor. So there's, there's likely going to be a discussion about, do you still think the dump stinks? And I think that's a good, I think that's a good discussion to have. Um, we, we essentially have to take it as it comes, you know, but I think it's important to get the ball rolling. Thank you. Any other counselors on the beautification committee want to jump in? Sage was so informational. I think you're leaving everybody speechless. Councilor Pruitt, I see your hand up. Yes, I wanted to mention, I know uh, Sage in particular, I'm not sure, and I think Ken would be interested, you know, would be aware of this, but we have started on the, uh, the uh, they're calling it the Castle Creek Greenway, which is uh, something that the town has already voted on and agreed to. It starts on the other side of Preemption Road, uh, past the Indian Mound, where there's a swamp up there, eventually, it, it hopefully, uh, hook into the Ontario County Pathways, and it follows the old Lehigh Valley uh, element all the way down to Clark Street here on East North Street. And there has been some work, Katie Labby's been involved in most of the meetings, but, and I think most of you haven't really been brought up to date on it. But the, uh, the pathway's been cleared fairly well from Clark Street uh, along the top of the berm all the way to uh, Uncle Joe's Pizzeria, uh, right at that intersection there. And also some of the work is gonna be starting up by Cornell Agritech working toward the middle. Now, I know, uh, you know, everybody's been very busy lately. We've called for a, a meeting, really, to try to bring anybody in the city that Sage and Adam wanted to bring up to date on this. There's a couple of issues relative to the berm starting to slide away in a few locations. So there's going to be some issues that we're concerned with we wanted to bring up. Uh, and also to really show you some pictures of what it looks like and discuss uh, really when to begin trying to plan the, the hook into the crossover to the lake. Eventually, what they want to do is to tie this in again to Ontario County Pathways through Geneva and then onto the Finger Lakes Pathways, which continues on past Seneca Falls. So uh, I know that there, there will be discussions in the future where to cross over from uh, East North Street over to the lake. But uh, I think really it might be getting toward time with some of the work going on already, uh, since it will be a several year project to have like a subcommittee or the occasional meeting and uh, uh, on behalf of uh, six or eight people that wanted to get involved, if, you know, would still like to have a teleconference whenever, you know, it's convenient for city management. 
Uh, if, are there any questions about what's going on with the trail? Frank? Councilor Gallagher, you're on mute. Um, my question is, where does it start? Up on a mound on where Preemption Road? Do you know where the elevated Lehigh Valley used to used to cross right here at Clark Street, right on East North Street near St. Patrick's, and it extends yep. all the way up to, well, past where the Indian Mound is. It goes off into the, there's a beaver pond. I don't know if you're aware. Okay, um, I know what you're talking about. And it stops right about the beaver pond because the beavers have been active and they've got to drain that off first. It's one of the things we wanted to talk about. And so they're draining that off. And then I think uh, it won't be really more than, I think you could actually do some nice hiking and, and even biking in a couple of sections already. But we don't want to start that and getting the public involved until, you know, until the green light goes on. Uh, so again, uh, it's already been as cleared as much as we're going to without bridges. I think down here at this end uh, of town in the sixth ward and up in the, uh, the far west, I think that'll be the next section moving toward, uh, toward Uncle Joe's Pizza eventually. And then, uh, and then we'll have to make decisions on bridges and, or stairs or something like that to make the road crossings. Sage? Just gonna know, I think it's wonderful that activity is happening. I always love to see on the gra grassroots level. So thank you, Councilor Pruitt, for jumping in to help uh, be that conduit. We do have a grant that we're waiting to get the state contract on that will be able to do the feasibility and then the schematic design to be able to rebuild the bridges and then connect all the way over to the lakefront. So that's something that is ex exciting piece, but it's nice to see something jumping forward as that'll take a little bit longer um, and it's hard to wait for. There's some great maps that they put together. Scott from the Cornell Agritech has been wonderful on this. Councilor Regan, I believe you had your hand up. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I guess this is a this is sort of future beautification, I guess you'd say, relating to the landfill. Um, I I always like an opportunity to mention the uh, vermiculture composting uh, facility, which, from my understanding, uh, got the pro uh, the process um, to or the recommendation to proceed at the end of last month. So it should be under construction now, I understand. And um, we'll be opening and active soon. And what that is gonna do, when we talk about the landfill, it has the potential to reduce what Genevans put in that landfill by 54%. If you um, count in all organic waste, including yard waste, um, the, the benefits to the city are going to be spelled out in a user agreement, much like Casella has really with the landfill, only um, this won't have the same odors. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the other benefit there, it, you know, if, as this plays out would be the, you know, the trash um, trucks on the road, et cetera. So, um, you know, I, I just am always anxious to hear updates on that project and as well as to let you all know um, you know, that it is underway. I'm, I'm trying to stand on top of that one because it's a, a strong interest. And, and Sage, um, I don't know for staff, when we talk about, uh, we had achieved a silver status, and I, I'll probably get this wrong, with um, some green initiatives, and we were shooting for gold. Do any of these initiatives drive us closer to that gold status? And I think we're not quite at the silver level yet, but it's a okay. climate smart community. And uh, Adam has been uh, working on that. And then Katie has been also looking in our last some points that came with the new electric charging station that's behind City Hall. Um, but it is, it's we're kind of the level we need to do a lot to get to the next, but it is something that we haven't forgot about. I know the Green Committee, I think is also hopefully looking at that too and finding ways that we can increase our efforts. I don't know if Adam, it, you have anything else to add. There was very few communities that were at the bronze level. Is that where we're at? And we're headed to the silver level. So I, I just want to like to keep that on our radar. What do you know, Adam? Well, they had uh, <laughs> originally we were headed towards silver and then they changed the different silver, platinum, gold, whatever. So they kind of threw us for a loop there for a while. The, the good news behind all of it is that we are still trying to check things off that checklist, uh, regardless of the points. 
it's something that the, a lot of the things on there are beneficial to the community and they're things we want to do anyway. And so what it, what it does is it acts as a very good guide for us to pursue different projects, different grant funding, rather than to solely be focused on the status. I do have a nice little sign on my wall, um, but it's nicer to see our utility bills shrink. So we are working on that still, um, but we've, we've got all the low hanging fruit out of the way. And so now we're trying to chip off some of these bigger things uh, little by little. And, and Council Pruitt, I just, uh, I think you've gotten the same phone calls I have about um, the work going on on the path. Um, concerns with um, maybe security and concerns with maybe uh, anything that might be uh, related as far as litter goes. So just somewhere in our discussions and, and as we move forward with the project, I'm a big bicyclist. You know, I, I'm looking forward to taking my fat tire bike on rides down the trails. I, I enjoy that. But um, I also don't want to go for rides and, and see all kinds of trash or other security issues there. It's interesting. Um, Wait for the bridges, too. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I might be able to jump some rivers or something. I'm not sure. The, um, you know, w we have a great... Uh, playground down at the end of my street, Ridgewood Playground, and it's the basketball court is very well attended, and and I appreciate it. Um, sometimes it's a little overcrowded than than I would expect it, but one of the things that kind of hurt my feelings this morning was after there was a a large group of people playing basketball last night. Um, I drove by this morning, and all the waste was there, the the empty McDonald's bags, and you know, within 50 feet is the trash receptacle, and it's just, you know, the respect for the the, the place that you're using and, and how do you create that respect so that people get to that everybody gets to use it gets to enjoy it and not certain people have to come along and clean that up i think that's one of our challenges counselor cam i see your hand going up um just on the composting um system i just wanted to ask adam i uh, drove over there i i think late last week and um saw that they started clearing uh, the brush and everything next to the transfer station and they're going to do something with the fence and stuff. So I, I guess there's evidence, like you say, of construction has started. Is there any estimate as to when the composter is going to be ready to take compost? So the work that's being done right now is being done by city staff. They're yeah. working on clearing that out and we're waiting on still a few more submittals from the contractor to get started. And so once we get those, we'll have an idea of how long it should take uh, and when they will be finished. But once construction starts, it shouldn't take more than a couple, I don't know, maybe two weeks. I, it shouldn't take very long at all because it's just basically pouring concrete. Okay, so it's not, so really, construction hasn't started. The city's just getting things out of the way so that they can start. But do you think they'll start by the end of August? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I see Council Peeler with his hand up again. Oh, I got to go back to Council Pruitt. I'm sorry, because he had his hand up first, and I forgot. Council Pruitt? I'm sorry. I would have let Bill go first. Uh, uh, basically, I, I, don't, I don't mean to be talking so much, but this was something I was, it was interesting to me, and I'm on the other committee. Uh, I noticed when a tree was taken down in my yard, I looked up some of the, the regulations some time ago, and it mentions when a, an, a mature tree is taken down in Geneva, another one should be planted there. And that didn't happen for a whole string of trees, at least along my street. And so I was lo looking forward to trying to find it again in the codes to find out what, what are the rules for really the city being able to plant trees where it wants to and, and at what time. And one of the reasons that's important is because I know everybody was talking about that in the retreat. One of the ways to beautify the city is to put more trees in. And we've got them all starting to germinate in the new nursery and, uh, and the shade tree committee is kicking up again. So. With that being the case, uh, you know, as you're checking into this, it'd be nice to really examine the codes and really what our, our uh, abilities are to be able to plant at will. That was just a comment to pass along. Looks like Sage has a hand up. I do. I would love to, to add that something I'm passionate about. I mean, those are a value to everyone in our community and last, you know, for over 100 years. It had been, so it's a mixture of budget and uh, there had become a practice that we had if residents didn't want a tree in front of their home, the survival rate was low. And so a lot of effort we go through to try to get folks that wanted another tree 
but it, as a result of that practice, less trees have been planted. And I would love for the Shade Tree Committee to um, make a recommendation to council that maybe council, you know, says we're going to replant. Sometimes you have to wait a couple of years. Sometimes it's not a proper place to plant, but to really put more emphasis on that. And of course, I'm saying that with a very difficult budget in front of us and a um, we're still working off the 2015 tree inventory where we've had identified safety risks that we have to take care of. But we are, you know, growing trees. Uh, trees, they're, when we're not growing them, the cost is about 125 of average per tree. Um, and so we have gone after grants and also been reimbursed for, for trees as well. And so it is something that we need to put more emphasis on over the next couple of years. Uh, in addition to all the work in the foundry area, of looking at if trees aren't being replanted, is there another plan for really um, getting those back to uh, levels in which we, we saw before? Um, so those are all discussions to have. I think uh, it's important. I think the Shade Tree Committee can be involved in that to maybe bring some recommendations to, to City Council to have it be a, a priority. Councilor Peeler. Yeah, this is actually a question for Jan. Jan, is there more than one verm, vermin, verminiculture or verminicompost facility? I, I, this, this was presented to me the other day. Is this the one you're talking about? Oh boy. Oh, well, now that is a, um, it's gonna be hard for me without having it in front of me, but Growing Cycle, I, well, I see the name Growing Cycle, um, is a, it's a, that's a, um, a company that does pick up. They pick up the compost that's placed in front of houses and that just originates in home. Right now that is being taken to um, Seneca, um, boy I want to say Seneca, yeah, Castle, Seneca Castle and it, there's a vermiculture composting facility you'd call it there um, and it was designed by the same person who designed the one that we're looking at for here. Only ours benefits well, from the experience of that, um, you know, of, of that facility. So how do, I mean, there's, a, there's an X, if anyone is not familiar with this uh, growing cycle, it looks like you can contact Trisha Meany at info at blueprintgeneva.org. There's the contact information right there. And this looks like something that's pretty good. I mean, it's wonderful. In fact, if, if, if I, what I would like to propose, I mean, we, it's hard to talk about anything, um, you know, that involves money, but is, is getting that company and other companies to um, do that for all our residents once we have this vermiculture uh, center up and running, to do that for everyone as part of our taxes. Um, I did mention that at our retreat way back when. Um, and when I first moved to Geneva, that was the practice in the early 80s, I'd say. They called it Class A garbage and it was taken away. But yeah, so they've been doing that and taking care of it. Also, the um, uh, Waste Not store downtown will take composting. So there are many people doing it, but that, uh, they're not actually um, processing it. They're bringing it to the Ca uh, Seneca Castle um, place where it is processed in the method that we'll be using as well. They take they take a lot of things. So I guess you can just contact info at blueprintgeneva.org and see what kind of garbage you can you can give them to take, and then they can turn it into usable material. I see. Councilor Burrow and then Councilor Cammer. Jacob Fox would be happy to give any of us a tour of the operation out in Seneca Castle. I've already had the tour. Um, I've been composting in my backyard for 20 plus years, most of those years illegally. Um, and also I just started uh, food scrap composting in my backyard, although I, I do not do it with worms and I'm not collecting the juice, which is what is done through vermiculture. Um, uh, Jacob would also be an excellent person to also come and bring a, bring a presentation to council about how the process is actually going to work on Doran Ave. Um, but we do have to get, you know, and th this, is, this is treating waste for the future. And, um, and, the, and the sooner we can all be part of it, the better off essentially the world is going to be. But I can pass Jacob's number on to you, Bill, and, and anybody else. 
Council, Councilor Camera, please. Just from my own experience, we are a customer of uh, Growing Cycle, so they pick up once a week. We're a family of three right now. We fill it. We fill, it's a it's a small, I don't know, gallon and a half, two gallon container. It's circular. It just sits on our front porch. We fill up a bowl on our kitchen counter every evening and then take it out and put it in the thing. It has a little plastic bag that's um, compostable that sits inside of the container. Um, the, I've met the people that pick it up. They're great people. And you can compost even meat. You can even put throw meat in there. You can throw, they, they uh, will take away uh, shredded paper. So, um, because they do, they do need the carbon from paper to help the process. And um, I think it's fully their intention. Instead of taking it out to Seneca Castle, they're going to be taking it to our vermiculture uh, composter once it's set up and going. Um, and um, from what this is, Adam can correct me on this, but um, the vermiculture operation that's going to be at Doran Avenue is going to be self sustaining. So it's not like that's the whole they, thing. They, they want the composting and are either going to charge nothing for it to get composting from a, a local firm like uh, Growing Cycle or very little because apparently once it's converted, it's, um, it's valuable and it, you can sell it. And um, um, the more this happens, the better. Um, and I probably said this once, but Hobart William Smith takes theirs, um, you know, their slop and all that stuff when they were then when their kitchens were going, and um, that was composted at some farms and used by farms locally, well, locally, 10, 15, 20 miles away, and um, so we're going to be hearing some re reactions to how that's a good soil amendment and is good for, uh, and it's approved by the way, by the DEC for uh, growing crops in. So that's my, that's what I know so far. Thank you, Council. I don't see any other hands. And as I mentioned at the beginning of um, this work session, we, we promised we would start off with beautification, but there's been a variety of other topics that have come up. Um, the table is open for topics since this is a work session. All I ask is that we stay in order of some sort so that we can work together. And if nobody has any topics, my Chinese just got delivered. No. <laughs> Council Pruitt, did you have your hands up? Just a quickie to add on to what was just talked about with the vermiculture. I, I went over to the water sewer place myself not long ago. And uh, Will and, and Nick are still inviting us to come on over. Now in January, I wasn't interested in going and freezing, but it is better weather now, perhaps September, October, uh, especially since it's in the wide open spaces. When I was a little kid, Doran Avenue was the dirt road that we used to ride uh, our bicycles and mini bikes down there. I couldn't get over what a big change it is. It's a $50 million facility. It's really fascinating to, to see and to learn more about. And it would tie in really to a visit to the nursery, the vermiculture, and the, the water and sewers. So I would like to see if, if you folks are as interested and I am as, as maybe catching all three of those things on a, on a, on a tour. I, it's a great idea. Me and Councilor Noon took that uh, tour in January. It was cold, but it's amazing. The, those, the, the employees that run those facilities and the efficiency that the gains that they've gained throughout the years is just amazing. And I think it's important for every councilor to understand the inner workings of those departments, especially when we're moving into budget season. I think it's critical, so it's a good idea. I, I saw Councilor Cameron, I think I saw Councilor Regan. I'm not sure who was first. Councilor Regan? Uh, oh. I, I can't, can't, Flip can't, a coin. Cameron, feel free to chime in if you're, okay. you can start. Um, I, I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about this uh, Wednesday night, but uh, I would have to say that I'm, um, it's kind of been an interesting month. It's been a, 
sort of a confetti storm of emails and, and everything else going back and forth. Uh, it's been hard for some of us uh, to keep track of um, um, documents and version control and everything else. But my impression of what's been going on for the last month is that um, what started out as a vote for five of, se of nine or seven resolutions to address concerns of um, the PPP and Black Lives Matter and social justice issues in the city of Geneva um, and, and to address that. And it morphed from that and, and setting the stage for public hearing, which was supposed to happen uh, this Wednesday, uh, it morphed into an issue for me, anyway, at least, of uh, democracy. And um, if my recollection is in, uh, is uh, correct, um, we in the in the in the conversation, and obviously it was a six and a half, six hours and thirteen minute council meeting, so we were all pretty beat. Um, by the time that thing ended, but um, my impression was is that a hearing should happen uh, for a P police accountability board. Um, I um, had my reservations about it in, in in the fact that I had presented a resolution earlier that didn't just focus on police accountability, but on some of the the issues like uh, full disclosure of complaints against uh, uh, officers, which the governor has superseded and asked that we make that process transparent and make those records available. Um, but there's, and, and things like reviewing deadly force policy, looking at body cam information, talking about training. Um, you might recall that I've uh, talked about Smile School for our police officers because there's a certain uh, demeanor I'm concerned about. Um, and so <clears throat> after we established that we wanted a public hearing, we, besides hearing that night about it, we also heard within the next uh, week or two about, we want to get this right. We only have one shot at it, this kind of discussion and language, when we all know, well, at least I believe that no legislation is perfect and it's not going to be perfect, uh, you know, uh, from the get go. The, the, and, and so what happened and morphed over the period of a month was essentially we went from rejecting a viable placeholder for starting the meeting of doing the public hearing on August 5th. It was a viable placeholder. It was in lieu of one that the city started working on based on the materials that were provided or were obtained from the Geneva, from the Rochester Police Department. The work had been done for us. We could have used it as a placeholder. We knew already at the time that there were gonna be amendments made. So it wasn't gonna be a one and done. There wasn't gonna be a vote for the Police Accountability Board based on the, the exact framework and knowledge and le or whatever language of the placeholder. I had proposed changes to the placeholder, which I submitted long before we got to the need to make filing dates and notify the newspaper and everything else. But basically what happened in my opinion is a minority of counselors and staff and the attorney that is, our, that is employed by city council work together to delay the public hearing August 5th. They superseded the majority vote. And my concern now is turning toward the democracy we are supposed to have. And I have some serious concerns about this because I wonder what are we going to do from now on if this becomes normal practice. 
Um, I have questions to ask, and I'm going to ask them. Well, I'll tell you one of them right now, and I, that is, I'd like to know about the discussions that were had between the city attorney, the city manager, and the mayor, and possibly the deputy mayor, related to seeing that this would be delayed. I feel I'm going to give give the attorney a little bit of an excuse or a pass because he works for both us, the city council, and he works for the city manager under the aegis of the city council. And I think there's lots of evidence that he was going in two directions at once. Well, not completely at once, but he was going in two different directions over the course of this month. So I have some serious concerns about the democratic process and um, I'll read from our city charter sections of our code that are related to section 4.5 in the city manager's position, section 7.5, which governs the hiring and firing of our city attorney. And it can be done by a vote of five to four and um, you know what? I'm, get, I'm starting to get close to wanting to test that. And um, those are my concerns. I have that, these concerns for democracy. And um, we are now asking to delay the public hearing for the end of, the, of August. And we can all say, well, you know what? That's just, just 30 days. And uh, whatever, but the placeholder that's been put into place is lacking the, lacking the tenor and the framework of what we were talking about in late May and the run-up, or in late, late June, the run-up to the uh, vote for a public hearing on July 1st. So I, I've got some big concerns. Um, Never thought I'd get to this point um, in city government. And um, I also want to go on record as um, seconding uh, the mayor's recommendation that Councillor uh, Galanese resign. Um, we have so much work to do, and I think it would just be appropriate for us to move on because I am really concerned about the fiscal future of this count, this city. And um, I, did, I think right now we're, we're at the control, we're, we're, we're in the, you know, we're, we're at the bridge on the Titanic. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Regan, I have you and then Councilor Peeler. Um, uh, wow. Uh, that that's that's a lot um and and uh in particular two huge issues that we definitely need to, to discuss i'm going to go back to um back to your concerns about the democracy part um i i you know we've had so many emails between ourselves on this and and i have not been shy in in my in voicing how i i feel which i it was kind of a jaw dropping thing for me to watch this unfold. But um, uh, so I, in a way, entering this meeting, I feel like we've kind of gone through a lot of it. So what I'm going to add to what Councilor Cameron just said is, is, you know, sort of looking ahead and worrying that this could keep going because, you know, we can't change um, the way this unfolded. It made it essentially illegal to have that to call this a public hearing, and we do have to, we have changed it now to a public forum um, because of all these delays that were really unnecessary. It was miraculous when, once this decision was made that suddenly we got this law that could have been the placeholder we were talking about. Um, five of us had put forward a placeholder that would have served that purpose, as, as Councillor Cameron said, without question it would have either the vote would have been tabled or at least amended etc but so just though to continue that that trend um 
to another dangerous area. We also voted on several other policing initiatives, which are important. And, and you know, at the very end of the month, I find out that one of our, our counselors, my friend and, and, um, and our, our, co our, our um, colleague, Anthony Noon, was charged with writing the bylaws for those. In other words, kind of getting them started and he voted against those. So it, it seems peculiar to me that someone who was not supportive would be the one laying down the initial rules. And I've been trying to prepare for Wednesday's meeting and looked at the uh, bylaws that are established on the body cam. I haven't dove into the other one in quite as much um, detail, but uh, it's, it's obvious that it doesn't address the resolution whatsoever. So I'm just saying, bring this up. I don't know whether this is going to be the meeting to discuss those details, but I, I, I do want to say that this dangerous step of taking the majority's voice and having it, you know, kind of replaced by the minority for whatever reason is, 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 is kind of frightening and I think dangerous and, and, and a slap in the face to democracy. Just one of the things I wanted to- ca Counselor, Counselor Cameron, just hold on, because you're next in line. I, I, yeah, wait, I was we, saying- Rule of order, we go around, when everybody's done, you get a second chance. Thank you, Counselor Peeler, you are next. I'll concede my time to Counsel, Counselor Cameron. Counselor Cameron, it's your turn. Make a point of, I think uh, Jan said it, uh, uh, well enough, but it's the idea of, I think everybody knew the legislative intent. So of the five that voted for this. So what my understanding is of the rules or no, of the sort of um, in the charge of the city charter is Council makes policy, staff and city manager help administer and effect that policy. That means, in, to me, helping with the details, helping with us getting and perfecting uh, uh, the, the information, which, and the thing is, is that if there were impediments to getting this public hearing going, for August 5th, which was our intent as a group of five, the majority, the legislative intent that I'm really mentioning, then city staff and the attorney could have said, well, we're going to have to do this, this, and this, and they could have done it in time for us to have done that. And that would have been a good signal to at least half of our community, which, it, which has been waiting a long time and and is now asked for with some sense of urgency that we move forward. So, and, and I, and one other thing, and that is, is it was, we had a meeting of a council, which was a coined as a led as a meeting between city attorney and being our, our attorney and advising us as clients or as client, whatever it is on Wednesday night, about the difficulties and of implementing something like a police accountability board based on history and the involvement of civil service and everything else, you made our jobs really, really difficult because that was, if anything, a technical meeting. And now the public hasn't gotten the benefit of understanding those things and those elements and the degree of difficulty that's being asked to set up a police accountability board and the nine of us have to somehow remember all that and put it all together and do it in an articulate way that doesn't sound like an excuse. So that didn't help us and I wish that staff and the city attorney would have put, up, put themselves in our shoes to try to explain this to a public that's much bigger than the nine of us who are intensely interested, and that makes our job really difficult, and it could have been done Wednesday night. Thank you.
Councilor Peeler. I'm finding this discussion really bizarre that we're talking about saving money during a time of budget crisis when uh, going forward with a dysfunctional resolution will expose us to a lawsuit that we might lose just on that fear on that notion and focusing on a placeholder law when a actual law should was still never or the a placeholder or an actual law was still not provided during the time that we passed that resolution so it, this is a very strange conversation to be referencing something that never existed as proof that we did something so um we really this is an opportunity to fix something that we did. And rather than going backwards and trying to deny that the mistake never happened, I think it's a really good opportunity to move forward with something authored by us, with something that is takes into account our feedback, takes into account other feedback, and, and doesn't immediately expose us to something very expensive because we still have a duty to the budget and to the people of Geneva. And I think we're doing the right thing with this, with this reset. Is it unfortunate? Yes. Is it an abortion of democracy or some sort of violation of democracy? How? How is it a violation? We're fixing it. Okay, Councilor Pruitt. Well, I think it, it was meant to be fixed. Uh, I think it is a violation of the, of, of the democratic process. And I think really there was time even before the vote of the last meeting to have reviewed the material. And I think the, the five weeks or so that we had, I, I don't think it should have taken that long to come together. It, it's, it's simply poor organization on all of our parts. We simply didn't pull together in terms of putting an organized plan and executing it effectively. I think it's also unfortunate that really our, our city council talks to the media too much. Shouldn't be a spokesperson for the council. I don't think that reflects well on us, and I hope that gets stopped. I, I think uh, really, I, I also hear that it's sort of water under the bridge at this point. We look like like Shlomiels in many respects, and I resent being put in that kind of position. I think we could have managed just a heck of a lot better, but we're, we are where we are. I think what I've just seen being submitted does not reflect what the people have asked for. So I'm not sure that we're that much closer together than what we were over a month ago. And so uh, I think we're gonna probably have to really hash through this a lot on, uh, on Wednesday night. But the other thing I heard was that, uh, that we should ask for a resignation of one of the counselors. And I'm not in favor of doing that to anybody for any reason out of this group. It's not up to us. If we start really castigating each other and trying to push each other out because of varying opinions, what's to stop that from becoming a practice of, that could influence voting in the future? It shouldn't come from us. We're not the authority of each other. And so I really would, uh, would say that, that uh, that's not something I would push for. I think if you have an opinion on that, that's fine. You're welcome to express an opinion, but I don't think we can call for a resignation. And so really, I would say, yes, I think there's been an abomination of the democratic process. I think that it's unfortunate. I don't think it should happen and it ought to be stopped in the future for, you know, for better, for, through better communication. And I think really the problem I see right now is we're sort of flat footed. It's like we're starting all over again and we ought to make sure that we don't do the same thing again. There ought to be like a Gantt chart put together for every little thing we're gonna do over the next month. And, and that's what I'd like to recommend, that we have it written down in terms of who's responsible for what, over what period of time and how we communicate about it. And I'd say we could do that tonight or Wednesday night or some other special meeting night. That was my, my comment. Also, Salamandra. Um, I'd just like to echo what um, counselors Camera, Reagan, uh, Pruitt said about um, overriding democracy. Uh, five counselors voted for a police accountability board with teeth. Um, it, our sentiments were clear, this, but the obstruction hasn't stopped. The new local law proposed by the attorney is nothing like what the people or the five of us were talking about doing. And so I believe that the city attorney should work based on the direction of the majority of council and draft a local law or prepare the PPP's law for a public meeting like he was directed to do. Good, my turn. So there's been a lot of, um, Councilor Bro, oh, I got you next. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand before I started to speak. 
So there's been a lot of talk about the dem democracy of, of the process and um, why things weren't done in a timely manner. I, I appreciate all your concerns. Um, we got together in November and December. We talked about the city charter. We talked about rules of order procedure. We talked about a lot of things that counselors, new counselors needed to know to move forward. Repeatedly throughout the last six months, I've had to try to talk about procedures and policies and, and try to explain things as we've gone along. I've even had a senior counselor where I've had to continually explain things, whether it's amendments or how to move things forward. Um, so I, I have my own frustrations. I don't want to get bogged down in, in what we should have done. Um, there was a procedural issue that wasn't followed completely. And yes, we did not follow the procedures completely. If you want support on resolutions, local laws or ordinances, the best way to go about that is to put them in front of staff who is the experts at this. I had four resolutions brought before me last Wednesday or Thursday, if I forget the date, I'm sorry. And I asked those two counselors to put those resolutions forward to let them go through staff in case there was any special recommendations or whether they should have been proclamations instead of resolutions. And there was great feedback that came from staff. And those counselors were responsible enough to follow a process that allowed them to have that professional input. For me, that's kind of the simple way of doing it. And maybe this is new ground even for me because I've never seen a local law that got presented the way it got presented. I've never, never had a public hearing be presented without a local law. And I've been doing this for 17 years. So the due process and the support of the experts wasn't leveraged at this time. So I asked this council, as we move forward, to lean on the experts that, are, that we pay on a daily basis to provide the input for us to how to move things forward in the proper manner. For me, that's, that's the win for all of us, is to, is to do things in the right manner and move things forward. And that provides for democracy at its best. Council Burrell. So um, thank you for that explanation. And, and I agree with what Council Peeler had to say about some of the difficulties of the law that was presented. And I also agree, agree with the other councilors that spoke in favor, and I was one of the five that wanted to have it on the agenda. Um, but, but I guess my really basic question is now, and I'll let you answer this, uh, Mayor, you know, I, I'm, I'm now confused with how we get something put on the agenda. So, and that's, and that's the democracy that, that I think we're concerned about, but no one has really asked if, if five people want something on the agenda, you know, what, what determines whether it goes on, no different than if one person wants it. So, that, my, so my question is really pretty basic. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So we have rules of order procedure and we have our city charter. Our rules of order procedure ask you to provide resolutions within six days. Now, it's unprecedented the way resolutions have been coming forward. And when you have eight or nine resolutions at one time, they don't get the ability to go through staff and go through legal, make sure the wording's properly, proper, make sure the city's not exposed, you know, Five counselors can vote on that. There's nothing stopping those five counselors from doing that. But the repercussions of not going through the proper process, at least the proper process the way I know it. And I really think we need to look at our, our Charter 7.5 talks about the city um, attorney look, um, providing resolutions, local laws, and ordinances. There, there's, a, there's a reason for that. There's a disconnect between 7.5 and our rules of order procedure. We need, as a council, to take a look at the, the connection between those two so that we're all protected on how that works forward. Um, I've not, you know, I've always had the city attorney, I've always had the city manager bring those resolutions forward. And if a counselor had an idea or the mayor had an idea, they would present that idea to staff to craft that resolution to bring it forward in, in, in an acceptable manner that, that met all the requirements. Um, so, so to me, I don't have a, a cut and dry method. I rely on the rules of border procedure. I rely on our city charter. I think there's some gaps there that we need to work with. I see three hands, three hands. I see, I'm sorry, I see Councilor Pruitt, Councilor Camera, Councilor Reagan, and Councilor Salamandra. Who wants, who wants what? Let's go ahead. I just have one, a really small point. I, I just want to be sure or just clarify 
that that we were voting for a public hearing. We weren't voting on a local law. We were voting for a public hearing to support a local law. The local law needed to be on the desks of counselors um, if delivered electronically, seven days, not including a Sunday. And, um, and, and we were advised during the actual meeting that that would take place over the course of time. Um, I, I, I just want, I, the only reason I bring that up again, and I, I see we're getting frustration below me on the square below me here, but um, is, is those were really the issues that from my understanding would have caused legal difficulty. Things in there about discipline in particular, et cetera. And as we have stated, um, it, it would have seen uh, amendments before um, you know, uh, before that was actually passed. And that's where the legal issues really were. That's my understanding anyways. Steve, you're good. I'll just, I'm sorry. So I'll just say, I mean, there's sort of silence. So I'll just say, yes, I don't think there was any legal exposure to uh, discussing something in a public hearing. And that's where the city staff could have said, we posited this at the, at the majority's request. We have presented this placeholder. A placeholder wasn't to be passed to basically operate city government upon it in the interim. That would have been something we'd call maybe an interim law. This is, was a placeholder for discussion. And at that point, I think that the city staff, the attorney could have said, as this presents on the paper, it has these issues. And one of them would have been appropriate to say, by the way, we have this attorney who is an expert on civil service law from outside counsel. We're gonna ask him to explain how, um, you know, uh, the civil service will be involved in a adjudication process of a disciplinary hearing for a police officer. So um, that would have all been taken into account at a public hearing, but again, it would have been done for the purposes of informing the public. I myself, while supporting that placeholder, recommended significant changes to its approach because I said, in my resolution or in my my guidance that in during these d discussions in the flying emails was the scope was so big that i doubt that we would have found nine people in this community who would serve on a board where at least to me the amount of work was double or triple for the first six to ten months of what we're doing and we're working overtime at this point. We have two or three meetings in addition to regular council meetings. So I wonder how volunteers could have been found for this board. The other thing is we're only 12,000 people in this community. That makes us, maybe we have 7,000 adults and we have to find two clergymen, two policemen, or no, two clergymen, two uh, lawyers. You know, we have all these guidelines on how you select um, members for this board which I think diminishes the population from which we could pick, then the workload is off the charts. And I proposed something which I thought was a middle of the road, not to be a middle of the road because I'm much more concerned about this board being effective. And that was, let's leave the investigations of these complaints. Let's take the complaints in a safe place so that anybody that has a complaint can provide the, their concerns and make their complaint, but let's have the investigations be done by the police department, open up the records of the officer in question, provide the body cam footage and everything else, and plop it on the conference table of the police accountability board. Because there is so much work there, we're talking about $100,000 to $200,000 of work that we would be paying for to enable this operation, this PAB to do its work. We're not a community that can afford a full blown 
completely independent um, organization. We've got to make some concessions to the to uh, pragmatic concessions. The recommendation I'm saying focus the PAB on reviewing the evidence, just the same way the ethics our ethics board they get the they get the information and they make a determination and then they pass that recommendation off to others. Yes, they can subpoena if they want to, but normally you wouldn't have to do that. And if if the police accountability board was not satisfied with the information the police department had given them or collected, they could then do something. But let's put some trust. We trust the police department to investigate crimes. And there are a lot more crimes out there than there are complaints against the police. And we trust the information they collect on those crimes. And we trust the you know the the, the you know the 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 uh, legal process to to uh, determine whether a crime was committed or not. Let's trust the police to collect the information. Let's not start an independent investigative thing. Now the the PPP and the Black Lives Matter all hate my suggestion, but those were on the table when I voted for. The police accountability board they were plenty of time everyone knew that there was not going to be a just one and done and pass that placeholder i supported that and i had amendments already and you all know i would have started crying for the amendments to be considered as i still am doing that because i don't think we can afford what 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 it takes and i don't think we have to and and really just have to we have to expose the community to what's involved when we do when we do an action you know against a, a for, for you know and it's 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 really just to adjudicate a complaint i think that would be a size that fits our community and something our board could do and then we have to take it from there. Yes, there's chances for bias leaking in after that, but I think we can handle that. And this would be a step forward to get an independent board to review that complaint. Um, I believe in the, in the forum where they had the, the forum on police accountability, um, Lucille Mallard averred in that, in her in her statements that they do now have a safe place for somebody to make a complaint they don't have to go down to the police department to do it so there is one thing that they've already addressed that's a concern so that means we can get the complaint and we can start the process and that's the signal to the police department to do that and i think that it's up to the sage and the chief to revise the procedures that effect that complaint process and get it done quickly and get it on the conference table of a police accountability board. So uh, that's, you know, it's a lot of, I know I'm saying a lot of words and all that stuff, but um, uh, we were not in legal jeopardy in having this conversation August 5th. Um, you know, well, with all due respect, Bill, I don't think we were in legal jeopardy by discussing. Thank you, Councilor. I can vote for that. So, wait, I have Councilor Solomon, Councilor Pruitt, and I have legal raising his hand, and I have Councilor Peeler. So, um, I'm going to defer to legal. Sage, were you raising your hand too? I see all these hands. I was, but I just get in line. So, thank you. So, let me go around the horn. Uh, I saw Councilor Salamander, Councilor Pruitt, and then we'll go to Amel. Well, I have a, a couple different points to make. I also remember our city attorney advising us that we could vote for this um, at the last council meeting and that he would prepare the law based on Rochester's legislation with input from several people. Um, 
that didn't happen. Uh, the new law does not include anything um, to do with discipline. I don't believe that the city attorney has provided um, a legal answer to that, a lot of highlighting, but not necessarily anything besides a reference to a Taylor law. There is another legal opinion, um, and I believe that our city attorney should be listening to the direction of counsel and looking into that. Um, we keep hearing about exposure and protection, and we're talking about it in a way that has to do with us as a city and liability when it comes to being sued by the police union. I would much rather be sued by a police union for standing up to protect our, our residents from a police department. The people time and time again standing in the way of police accountability are the police and their union and so i and i've just recently had a police complaint about a tractor trailer driving through a crowd of protesters which i brought to our police chief who told me who and then to sage and both sage and the police chief dismissed it without speaking to any of the 20 witnesses there looking at the video footage so I don't necessarily agree with Councillor Camera that we trust the police and SAGE to investigate police complaints. The movement is asking and saying that the police cannot police themselves. And so already we've seen the way that staff and the city attorney have changed the legislation from what we want, which is police accountability, into more of a police community relations board, which we've had and has not worked. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pruitt. Yes, I, I was actually backing up to some things that you'd said, Mayor, and that I think I agree, and I believe many of us would, that experience does count. You want people who have the most information, the most understanding to really do the work. But I think the trouble here is that that's, you know, that being us is the problem. The people don't trust us. They don't think that we've done that well in the past and that administration has been really fair to the, the people. Whether you agree or not, I, that's obviously the way that the, the movement feels. And so uh, I, I think really the, what we just proposed and what we're trying to put forward really isn't gonna fly. And so I keep wondering, what, what is the jeopardy that I just heard you know, Laura mentioned and others? You know, what, what is the, the financial risk? I mean, if we get sued, are we talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions? Of, I mean, what is, what is the downside that we're trying to protect? And I was sort of curious about that because this is gonna be an issue that continues to, write, to get, get raised Again, I don't see the uh, the movement really accepting, uh, you know, the, the the PAB the way that we're outlining it right now. So, what is our jeopardy? That's a good question. Is there ever? I, I, don't, I don't know if anybody can actually put a number on that. Why do the unions? Why are the unions running things? I mean, we have a government. I, listen, I, I don't know what the number is, and I can tell you that unions have a say, but there are laws in place. And well, we've, we've, been advised, we've been advised by council that there are certain items when it comes to um, interjecting into the current policies within the police department that could be in violation. Not everything, not everything that, we passed, that was passed at the last meeting was in violation by any means, but there were certain areas that were in violation. And when it comes to litigation, my experience with litigation is this, it's an open checkbook. You don't know until it's all over. You don't know the results of it. You don't know the cost of it. You don't know the complications of it until it's all over, especially in new territory. So I have... Um, but administrative council is the one saying that, it, that it's not working. Other council outside of administration is saying that those rules that have been cited aren't really that applicable. Again, it seems to be contentious or debatable. Yeah. And that's the problem, I think, that I'm not saying I have so much, but I think that's the problem the people have. They're hearing that the obstacle that we're, you know, that we're putting up isn't real. And, uh, and I think that, that some of you have seen the emails from one attorney in particular that wrote into us that said that and cited some of the regulations. I so don't wanna... I'm just saying, unless we address this, it's not going to go away. I, I don't know what the answer is right now, and I agree with you, Mayor, that it should be the most qualified people to, to be able to, to advise us here. But I think the advice is always subject to what is perceived to be uh, inside influence. So we have to be careful of that. And I might think maybe getting some, some outside counsel or maybe a third party might be valuable here. Okay. Um, so, Emil, did you still want to say anything? Or? Sure, thanks. So uh, first of all, um, 
you know, I'm listening to criticism. I'm not adverse to hearing it. Uh, accept the criticism and then give careful thought to what you're saying about the process. Uh, there were two things that Ken said that I think you want to address tonight. And uh, one was um, the fact that whatever legal advice was given last week uh, at a attorney client meeting, uh, the public didn't hear. So the question is, uh, especially since we're doing Zoom, uh, and would you, would you like to have uh, Mr. Corcoran and myself uh, either at the start of the forum or at some point during the forum do a presentation? So that's question number one. The other thing I heard was that, um, and I'm not sure who said it, you want, this, you want the process carefully mapped out as to what's gonna happen during the course of the next month. So um, probably the best way to do that is some sort of discussion. Maybe one or two of you could be uh, appointed to discuss. We can have fun with myself and the city manager, uh, maybe the mayor, and then those of you want to be part of it so we can discuss exactly w what's going to happen perhaps day by day, week by week, during the course of the next month. So I think those, those would be two good, good things to do, um, hearing your criticism and uh, then to assist you going through the process that you're gonna be going through over the next few weeks or month or so. It's just a point of information on Emil. I just wanna make, Emil, if you were, if the council wanted you and Mr. Corcoran to make a presentation, let's say on Wednesday. So the public can absorb it and we can absorb it better. Please make a pictorial flow chart. I, I you know, you may all think I'm obsessed with this, but I, I've been in enough consulting meetings with many clients and a flow chart helps us remember where things are. And Mr. Corcoran evoked the civil service and the Taylor law as issues that we would have to deal with in crafting our police accountability board. These are complexities. We, don't, we need to see the process so we can talk about the complexities. But if we don't know the process, then we're talking about both process and the, the actual details. Let's get the process out of the way so that we all understand it. And a flow chart is the fastest way we can do that and the most efficient. All right. So we, uh, we did a flow chart about local laws uh, probably 10 days ago, but th I don't think that's what you're asking. You're talking about explaining the legal issues with regard to uh, a, a yeah. oversight of the police department. This is a flow chart. What you provided us was this, a narrative. It's harder to follow, Emil. This was a flow chart for the public hearing process. We discussed it. So the thing is, is that if we were to create a police accountability board, we don't have to get into all the details, but if we just created one that had disciplinary findings, investigation, and everything else, show us how the process would unfold and show us the complexities and where the legal exposure would exist in a flow chart. That's all. Okay, I see a Councilor Salamander, but I think I had Councilor Peeler first and then you. I can't hear you, Bill. I can I can see my time to both Councillor Salamandra and the city manager. I just want to say that. Okay. Councillor Salamandra. Um, we just had a very ex expensive uh, meeting to hear um, Emil's opinion repeated, and so I'm just wondering if this would be an additional cost, and if so, um, can we also, um, you know, have someone present the opposing legal? Uh, opinion, which is seems to just get trampled on and ignored in these conversations. I also um, had a question for Emil and Sage. Um, 
about when I should expect the data that I, requ I requested on uh, June 10th. I know Emma was working on that. So it's important for me. me. We keep having police discussions and not to, you know, here we are again. I am not provided with the um, information I need to make these decisions. And I want to know what the holdup is. Well, um, <clears throat> am I muted? Okay. So I do have the some information from the chief and then I have responses to the uh, uh, inquiries. So clearly, some of the inquiries, including uh, num number number one, is going to take a long time to generate for thousands of uh, uh, use of force reports and so on. So right now, you've got to understand the city, the staff is under a huge burden dealing with the uh, request for foils and uh, that sort of a thing. But I'll I hope tomorrow I'll have some document in your hand. I finally got. The information from the chief it was my fault I misplaced it so um, but I you know I don't wouldn't expect any large amount of information quickly just because of the volume of information you're looking the staff time that's going to be required to uh, to do it the already existing burdens that we have to respond to the foil requests it's a, just a fact of life and you know just talking about legal costs the you know, the legal staff here is involved in a number of matters, you know, unrelated to what you're talking about now, PAB and so on, that have been very intense. It was an intense month. I thought maybe this past weekend things would relax, but they didn't. So, um, you know, it's been pretty much nonstop for me. Uh, With all due respect, um, I'm a city councilor with the right to inquiry and this council voted last month um, we're coming up on another council meeting where I still don't have the information. I think that this is um, an insufficient answer. I still don't even have a timetable. Um, and and it, it, I mean, this just isn't good enough. I'm taken. Council Regan. Uh, and then I'm, Council Noon. Excuse me. I have just a couple of things. And uh, uh, two questions, really. Um, on police, on the data, I know this isn't exactly what, what Councillor Salamandro is requesting and it may not satisfy her, but um, I, I did have a, a, the pleasure of speaking with um, the chief and um, he, he said to me, I don't know if you see this, and he showed me his monthly report, which is delivered to our, our city manager. Um, and he, there was also a report, I asked him if there was any breakdown um, in terms of police interaction with uh, racial, you know, um, data involved there. And there is a uh, monthly report, which now may be behind a little, but it, it does indicate um, traffic stops and whether, um, you know, the race of the individual and, and what happened. Uh, and apparently this is all foilable, which means we should be able to see it. But even just the report that he showed me that shows the number of times that um, the police uh, have been called and what that call was, I mean, that would be very useful information for us to see if that can be, you know, it's a hard copy, but obviously scannable. And if that could be a part of our packet, I, I think we would all welcome seeing that. And then I just have one more real quick thing to say, and that is, on the a question on the cost um you know we we are now into more than just our local attorney and i'm just curious um when we stu do start seeing our add-on attorney <laughs> um which is now mr costello i'm just curious whether we are aware of what that cost is or, or how that happens whether that's just approved by administration or or where because I, I have a feeling seeing that name attached to every one of these emails that we've done which um, sometimes do not need him included uh, I think that's starting to cost the city more than um, maybe necessary thank you, thank you. Councilor Councilor Noon so I will start by saying that I agree with Laura I would love to hear from the opposing legal teams I you know she Laura consistently references the ACLU and other experts that the PPP and other groups continue to work with and get their advice from and I've I've been wondering out loud for a couple months that boy it would be great to hear from them so 
I, I would be really curious as to what they have to say and, and uh, their actual thoughts from them about Emil uh, and his legal advice, as well as the law that was put forth by the PPP. So I am 100% on board with, you know, really wanting to hear from them, because uh, I've been very curious for months. Uh, the other night when we left the meeting, uh, the attorney client meeting, you know, I thought to myself, was I just in a twilight zone? Did I just hear counselors arguing or asking about what lawsuit would be cheaper for the city to be saddled with? And then tonight I hear it again. And I find that super troubling. Uh, I, I really wish more people from the public were listening to this right now. Uh, as an elected official from national all the way down to local, I think it's completely reckless and irresponsible for anyone to even mention uh, and bring up the notion of, of being sued or, or wanting to be sued or, you know, asking what would be cheaper to be sued by, you know, for police brutality or a inefficient PAD board. And uh, I, I mean, I mean, that's just ludicrous that we have counselors uh, entertaining the motion um, of wanting to be to be sued or not necessarily wanting to be sued, but just wondering about the cost of that. And then at the same time, you know, we have another counselor who brings up, you know, about expensive meetings and, and other things about, you know, the cost of attorney fees, but yet then turns around and, you know, is still in support of a law that was already deemed illegal, at least by our attorney's perspective. And so I'm just, I mean, this, this council, as I've said to many of you, is just truly a three ring circus. And if there's not anybody on the screen right now who doesn't think that, I'm not quite sure that you're sitting on the same board. Um, so, and that's that there's no, there's equal blame to all of us for that. Um, and it just keeps getting weirder uh, and, and more strange. And, and I feel like I'm continuing to tune into, you know, the, the Trump White House each day. It's like, what's gonna come next in the next episode? And that's kind of what we're turning into. And, and it's super disheartening. It's super disappointing. Uh, but I, I mean, just, just the fact again, hearing it again tonight about asking about lawsuits and saying I'd rather be sued for this versus that is just absolutely insane. So when those legal fees come, I do hope that the public knows who said it. Uh, I hope that all of the attorney fees are quantified uh, for all of us, for emailing Emil, emailing this attorney or that attorney, pulling him in for presentations, anything like that, because as I, you know, I'm a huge proponent of that being presented to the public. Um, but I, I just hope that uh, we come out of this twilight zone and uh, we all get on the same page. We have a fresh restart. Forget about what, you know, a uh, lawsuit would be cheaper to saddle our taxpayers with uh, and just, just move on. Let, let's do what's right so that no one has to pay any additional costs for anything. Um, and, and that's all I have to say. I see Councilor Cameron and Councilor Pruitt. And oh, wait, I see City Manager. Can I have? The city manager first, please. I'll be brief. One, I, I too hear all the constructive feedback um, and do take that into just reflection of, of how everything had transpired. I do want to say that the request to not have a public hearing, it was for on my end, listening to our legal counsel of AML of not following a procedure and I cannot sit in my seat and do something that's legally, that's not legal. And so that's where I was coming from. And knowing that if we had a placeholder that we'd have to redo a public hearing, we didn't have the right procedure in place and totally take the criticism of how the month played out. This is a big local law that our community is, could be very beneficial for everyone in our community, including the police department. And we want to make sure that we put something in place that, that we can really grow stronger together and that takes time and, it, and I am concerned on all the time tables that we're putting forward. And so I will be more vocal in just saying, I don't think that's enough time and that's not me. I'm not in support of a process or working through or helping you all come to an informed decision that you all have to make. You're sitting in a very difficult seat. But I will always say that if I don't think that the process or procedure is correct, even if it has to go against five counselors that are asking me to do that, I have to do what I feel is legally right. And I'm not saying you're not doing something legally right, but I have to follow the procedure in which, which I know or took on the role. But I do completely own all the constructive feedback on this last month has been very um, hard on the journey. And we still have a long way to go. There's 
a whole slew of guidelines that will be coming from the governor and digesting those and we'll be kind of sharing with one approach to do uh, to get that feedback and get through that process that we will be going on through uh, the April 1st deadline. I did want to also just say that we're, you know, finishing up the second quarter report and he hearing that you wanted to hear from all departments. And so we'll be uh, putting that information together and that will include data, but it'll be on a quarterly basis. And we can start with that. Uh, if you want to go to a monthly basis, we can have a conversation about that and just uh, time for all of the departments. But I'm going to start with the adding to what we've been doing for the quarterly reports to have the departments included and we're finishing that up. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager. My seat's pretty comfortable. I stole one on gaming chairs from the kids. I can't believe how comfortable these things are. Um, I have, wait, uh, all right, so I've got Emil raising his hand and I've got Council Calamont, sorry, excuse me, Councilor Cameron and Council Pruitt. Go ahead, Emil. Just uh, in response to what Jan said about the monthly uh, police report, you know, directed to SAGE. Is that something that's filed with your office that you could uh, generate uh, the, the historical reports or make them available somehow for the council to see? Those have been going to community compact, so we do, we can go back through some of those, but I would love to just start on the quarterly report and the annual report to begin with and then move forward if that's all right with everyone. Thank you. Councilor Why Cameron? not the monthly report? I, 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 let's stay in order here. Councilor Cameron, please. Um, um, thank you. Um, I look forward to these quarterly reports. That's great. Um, the, the, the thing was is that there was time to make the process toward the public hearing legal. But our staff didn't 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 pursue that they pursued an alternative approach and an alternative that was closer to their idea of what might be legal let's say and i have no idea i have no idea what they what the point was is there was time to say you didn't do this yet you didn't do this you didn't do this yet whatever and we could have we could they, they could have done this so <clears throat> And I, I just want to take one of the things I want to take a step back. Jan had this conversation with the police chief about getting data. I, I think that, you know, that there's, I've had so many emails by people saying, you know, do you talk to the police? Did you talk to the chief? Did you whatever? People have to understand out there, wherever you all are, if you're listening tonight, we are responsible to put into place a process. We have to do it in an objective way. We are not supposed to influence our design of this process by, you know, how great individuals on the police force are because I know we can find them or how one of us has got, you know, close friends or I had a really great lunch with the, the chief or, you know, uh, you know, Officer Valenti is a great guy. That is not the kind of information that we're supposed to collect and influence this process. The process, the, the, the data that I'm assuming inside me is that most of our police are great people and I want to keep them all. The point is though, we have to design a process that's objective and brings the community into place to be able to review bad behavior. We can't do it based on the personalities that, you know, and the relationships we've developed directly with people. Now, Jan asked for data. It's readily available. I don't understand why she can't be added to an email list. In fact, why can't we all? And we get data. Data is data. It tends to not have a personality. It tends to be, you know, it tends to, if it's correct data, it tends to be objective. That's what we need to work from. And then to, to say just think, if you're going to present these reports and everything else, let's get away from overly narrative platitudes. Give us data. Give us data that we can review and take and look at and ask questions about. 
And do, do us a favor, give us the report before the meeting so that when we come to the meeting, at least we have a shot at trying to understand it. You know, I've many times, Adam, can you send this after to this after the meeting? I want to prepare for Adam's presentation or Sage's presentation. So those are some like some, some guidance. We have a lot of processes to, to repair here. And um, you know, get us data. If Laura's data request is massive, then give us what you can give us given the constraints. Just give her what you have available now as a deposit on a later, later deliverable. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Pruitt and then Councilor Peeler and then Councilor Galanese. I see a lot of hands going up, so let me just kind of weave through. Councilor well, Pruitt? Well, thank you. Councilor Noon had mentioned a couple of things, and I want to say that I think wondering about what your risks from either side is not really ludicrous. I, I think it's important in any solid decision to know what your, you know, what your parameters are that you have to work within and to call the individuals on the council ludicrous, not the issue or the thought itself, is personally offensive. You can attack someone's ideas, not them as an individual. And really, I wanna caution you on that because it's not uncommon from you, in my opinion. Uh, and then uh, I think that's really the main thing that I wanted to say. We have to be a little bit more congenial with each other. We're not at each other's throats the way that it's starting to get to be. This is not so contentious among individuals. It's the issues that count, not, not the personalities, not the political ambitions. I think we're learning. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Peeler. Yeah, um, it's a, actually to piggyback off of what John just said, I, I, think, um, I think there is a big difference between contemplating risks and, like Icarus, attempting to fly too close to the sun. Geneva is a city who is financially strapped by multiple pressures. And to be contemplating a lawsuit um, and then also trying to race to the edge of its cost ceiling seems a bit irresponsible and 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 frankly weird. You know, I don't we're we're a city who shouldn't be taking too many risks with our taxpayers' money until until our revenue stream stabilizes back to where we were in 2019. And I think then we can start having larger conversations about costs. Also, can um, to save to save money uh, in any type of uh, secondary legal meeting, I would be more than happy to discuss with you. I took lots of notes, and I have a very very good uh, auditory learning memory of the legal meeting that we had after you left. So after you left, there was still some discussion after that, and I can kind of fill in any gaps that you might have. Um, secondly, I think if we're going to restore confidence to the public, we should do things that are uh, validating of trust. And one of them is not passing a resolution about a law that we have no intention to, in, to evoke, to invoke. I mean, that's what we're talking about, is we're talking about a law that we had no intention to pass that would have been blasted with amendments. And based on my understanding of the NICOM procedure, Every time that we make major amendments to that law, we do have to restart the process for a public discussion. So not doing it right the first time actually does cost us precious time if the urgency that we're hearing from the movement is to, is to be responded to. I think it's really important that we do it right so that we can be good, that we can be good listeners to, to what is on the table as far as urgency. Um, secondly, staff reports. Thank you for bringing it up. Jan, Laura, Ken, John, everybody, my little post-it note during our retreat said staff reports. And I think without good data, we're not going to be good legislators and we're not going to be good wards of the budget. Because that's really what we are, is we're wards of the budget. And now let's get to budget. We still haven't spoken at all about what the budget is going to be, look like after this type of legislation goes through. We've got lots of things on the table and there's really no budgetary discussion of how it's going to impact us, the taxpayers, or the multitude of dominoes that are going to go down in place once we get this going. And right now, based on Adam's uh, report that he submitted this morning or last night, it's like I, my email is like a blur. 
uh, it looks like we're still looking at a two or $3 million overall budget gap just this year. And that's averaging the best and worst case scenario. And I'm a big fan of actually budgeting for the worst case scenario, which looks like it's a $4 million budget gap. Well, that's huge. We're not talking, we're not, we're not, we couldn't even lay off the whole city and save $4 million. So we're talking about, we're going to need a loan. And, and I don't, that's what I'm thinking. Like we're going to need a loan to save $4 million or to, or to get $4 million to pay who we need to pay. So I think, I think a budget discussion is very important and I hope to see one very soon, not just about this year, but the following years and how we're going to be able to preserve our budget and preserve our services to our staff or services to our residents, including me and many people here, our residents and taxpayers, we're going to want some services. We're going to need some services. And we're gonna and we're gonna need uh, to do that with some smart budgeting. So I hope that I hope that comes back uh, into a focus that we can really, really kind of revolve around because that really is the the revel the kind of core. It's the sun in our solar system of decision making processes. Um, that's so one question: How how long did the meeting go after I left? Council. Um, I I think about twenty min twenty minutes, fifteen minutes. Thank you. 15 minutes. I could be wrong. Time seems to weird out when you're talking about legal. I can't um, wait till you nail those 15 minutes for me. You got it. I'll, I'll you can ask me anything and I'll give you all the, I'll give you all that I remember. So, um, that's really it. Okay. Councilor Galanese. I'm going to piggyback off of Billy with the staff reports and the many other council that have requested for them. I think that the more information and numbers we have, it makes our job easier to report back to people when they do ask us questions. Also, um, I'm a big fan of hearing the legal ramifications from the opposing side too, as Anthony brought up. I think that that's important. Um, and also, I know we talked about this when we first started, but I think that now that we're into the Zoom is pretty much the normal activity as of our council meetings from here on out. I can't see it changing anytime soon, but maybe we can do it as, you know, a PowerPoint presentation the whole way. So we're not just talking, we're also viewing documents, sort of what uh, Ken was saying with his uh, flow charts or something like that that gives you a visual is the narrative of the voice when you're talking of like when Sage or Adam, I mean, they, they both do a good job of it, but of, I'm seeing across the board with our meeting, um, especially when there's important stuff such as uh, the police accountability board and uh, some of the things that we have voted on um, more so that we can have a visual, not just talk about. So the general public can get a gist of what's going on instead of, you know, wondering. Um, that's my piece I have. Okay, my Chinese is now formally told. Are there any other discussions that we want to take place? I, I also just want to chime in and think uh, we should have the attorney from the ACLU um, present and giving a presentation at the same time that the fellow's name is John Corcoran. Uh, who met with us um, through Hancock Estabrook. Um, I got a great deal uh, of information from him who has a heck of a lot of experience with citizen review boards and PAB, however uh, you want to describe them. And it adds a whole new perspective on, on a PAB with teeth. Um, so, it's, it's, it's something that I think the public needs to hear because I, I made notes during his presentation and, and the types of complaints that a PAB or a CRB um, would be able to uh, review, uh, which are, of course, are all civil actions. Um, our charter does not allow uh, actually elective of officials to enforce a law. Uh, that's what's happening up in Rochester right now, where we're patiently awaiting the decision on that. But um, 
I, I, I do think that it would be helpful for all of us to take Laura's uh, uh, recommendation to, to have that attorney come and speak with us. Um, and, I'm, and I'm concerned about the disciplinary process, which has been the crux to all of this. And, um, and, and as you heard Wednesday night, um, um, it does expose us uh, to uh, uh, legal ramifications. And, um, you know, I, I was elected to, to uphold the law, as we all were, as well as our city charter. And, and we really need to focus on, you know, we had a discussion on, on what a matrix looks like. And should there be a matrix? Or should the matrix be through some other employment body? And if you were there, you heard John Corcoran's uh, words loud and clear. And, uh, and he, he told us uh, exactly what needed to be done. And, and again, um, I think we need to get uh, those two fellas um, or people um, on the agenda so we can, so we can hear um, uh, both sides. And of course, there's always three sides. So um, I'm, I'm all for that. Thank you, Tasha. I'd just like to say quickly, I think it's a bit disingenuous to suggest that when I brought up the, um, the matter of being sued, that I was doing it in a way to weigh our risk when the point of my statement was to say that we are exposed to risk by our police department. So the fact that we could be sued it, when our city attorneys are saying that that is the argument against what people are asking us to do, then we must question whether that is a is the only legal argument and when and when i say that we're being sued by people who are hurt by the police it's not it wasn't to say that um that's somehow less expensive it's saying that this police department is exposing us also so i think that those are conversations that we have to um have uh counselor noon we live in a world where people are suing and when our own attorney is telling us we can't do what we want to do because we're going to be sued then we we have to talk about being sued so i just wanted to clarify thanks for the clarification Emil, last word so um the, the question isn't uh we should do this or that because we might be sued the question is what's uh authorized by law and uh, what's the proper procedures that have been recognized. So it's not a, not a question of you shouldn't do this because you're gonna be sued. You know, you're talking about John Corcoran, who's an expert. He knows what's acceptable in these types of uh, uh, statutes, local laws, and uh, he knows what's held up and what hasn't. So it's not a matter, we're not worried about being sued. We're just telling you what, in our opinion, is acceptable and allowed according to our understanding of the law. And that's, I think, the bottom line. So Council Pruitt wants last word. Just wanted to say uh, to Mr. Bobe that there was a, a lady named Damaris, and I forgot the last two, uh, or hyphenated the last name, but an attorney wrote in specifically citing the laws that you had mentioned earlier and recount, recanting them in terms of uh, you know, presenting an, an opposite view. There's the ACLU, but there's also that that's already in everybody's email. I don't know if everybody's had a chance to read it. Anthony said he hasn't seen it either. But there's one, and what I'm saying is that I think it would be helpful to look at those points and respond to those specifically with John Cor Corcoran and yourself because they're already out there in the public and people will wonder about that. All right, make sure I have it. So I'm hearing you want John Corcoran to uh, participate Wednesday night. Sage, I think we want to coordinate that because I don't. I think we want to hear two sides. That's what I'm hearing at least. So if it's if it's able to happen on Wednesday night, I'm not sure who to reach out to besides John. So I, I excuse excuse me for not understanding that. But I think that needs to be coordinated. So if we can't have two, don't have none. Uh, is what I'm hearing, right? Or do you guys want to hear? Ballpark. What is one appearance by him cost? By uh, by John Corcoran. Well, if it's a Zoom appearance, uh, the hourly rate is a matter of record. It's two hundred fifty dollars. So if it's uh, two hours, it's 
$500. I don't know how much prep is involved. There's going to be some prep by me because of, you know, what Ken is talking about. And I'd like to consult with him to come up with a flow chart he wants. So, you know, there's, there is a lot of illegal expense going on here. Some of it relates to this and some of it relates to other matters that uh, are going on. Well, John, uh, Emil, if you want to, uh, I don't mind spending a little time with you and I'll try to develop a flow chart for you the way I did the other one and then you can correct it. All right. So we can talk tonight or tomorrow. Right. It was very helpful to talk to you a couple weeks ago. Clarification on the timing of a presentation. I'm, if I'm hearing correctly, if we can get an attorney from the ACLU as well as John Corcoran and be prepared for Wednesday night. I think that's the ideal, although just timing wise, whether in two days it doesn't seems tight I don't, or would you want to have it say next week so that's a question for all of you yeah, I, i'm also curious what commitment we've made to speakers i mean that would be a question for Lori. i guess i mean i wouldn't want to um you know unseat them and and uh you know i i can help with that um we have an hour and 45 minutes at the beginning of five o'clock and then we have a 15 minute pause. And then during our regular council meeting, we have another hour session of public hearings. So to add a presentation would in, in be inputted and in, that's a change to the agenda. So that would have to be inputted at the beginning of the meeting and add whatever X amount of time. So I think Sage has the right idea to try to make that collective effort of obtaining that information and then scheduling a meeting based on that. We wanted feedback to know that we're hearing you correctly. Hearing as a as a group, what what your well, my feedback is that the public comment should be left to the public, and that we should schedule the lawyers. And um, let's if we're having a public here, we changed it from a public hearing for a local law to now a public forum. And I don't think that it's a good idea that to then take up the public's time with lawyers to tell them what they can and can't do. So is everybody in agreement on scheduling another meeting to get input from various council members, various council, legal council, um, so the public can have that input? Do, do we have the money for this? No. Is it important? Yes. Where does it come we, from? We, we have to get past an issue. And if we're talking $1,000 or $2,000, we've got to get past an issue. We're, we're talking about drafting a law that requires legal counsel. So, so it's an expense that has to, that has to occur. And, and why don't we have a work session that just has to do with um, listening to legal counsel? So why, why don't we set that up at the, at the, at the two clients convenience, uh, perhaps uh, next week on a day of their choosing. Sounds like a start. We'll wait for Sage to give us that feedback based on our contact information with outside counsel. Yep. Anyone can feel free to give me recommendations as well. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second. I got Councilor Peeler, second. Councilor Noon, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'd like just like to thank everybody for your time and your input, which is valuable, both counselors and staff, which is huge and legal. And um, I appreciate all of it. It was a good conversation. Thank you. Have a good night.